Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to go over a problem with you that will show you how you can calculate the weighted average cost of capital for a firm that is private, that is not publicly traded. And you can also use this problem to figure out the weighted average cost of capital for a firm that is publicly traded but has uh, multiple divisions. And those divisions, of course, are in separate businesses. And the stock of the overall firm is traded, but there is no stock, of course, trading for each of the separate divisions. So let's go straight to the problem. So suppose Nosebook is a private firm. Okay, it's interested in doing an IPO and the firm's CEO, Mr. P. Nokio. Hmm, what are the odds that a firm called Nosebook will have a CEO called Mr. P. Nokio? Anyway, Mr. P. Nokio wants to figure out the firm's uh, weighted average cost of capital. Now, before we go any further, recall that the formula for weighted average cost of capital looks like this, where you're taking a weighted average of the firm's cost of debt, which is expected return on debt, and cost of equity, which is expected return on equity, where the weights are the firm's debt ratio and the equity ratio in market value terms, and the cost of debt that we consider is the after-tax cost of debt. So the expected return on debt is being multiplied by one minus the tax rate. Okay, so now we are told that the firm has three close competitors. There is firm X, firm Y, and firm Z. And we are also given some information on the betas of these three competitors. So these betas are actually referring to the equity betas or the riskiness of each company's or competitor's stock. So the symbol that you can use for this is equity beta or beta S, which is beta of the stock. On top of that, you're also told the debt ratios of these three competitors. So firm X has a debt ratio of 10%. This means that debt in market value terms as a fraction of the value of the total assets, which is B plus S, which is the market value of debt and the market value of equity. So debt as a fraction of the total is equal to 10% here. It's 25% for firm Y and for firm Z that is 36%. Furthermore, you're told that the risk-free rate is 4%, Nosebook's cost of debt suppose is 5%, the expected market risk premium is 7%, and Nosebook's target debt ratio is 20%. So Nosebook is targeting a debt value as a fraction of its total assets equal to 20% itself. The question is, what is the firm's cost of equity Okay, every time you hear cost of equity, think CAPM. So cost of equity is the same thing as the rate of return that equity holders require, which according to the capital asset pricing model is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta of equity into the expected market risk premium. The question that is being asked is what is the firm's or Nosebook's cost of equity and then also the weighted average cost of capital. Let's talk about cost of equity first. So for cost of equity calculation, you require three things, as we just said, the risk-free rate, the equity beta, and the expected market risk premium. And if you take a look, the risk-free rate is given to you, that is 4%, so you're like, okay, that's done. The expected market risk premium is given, which is 7%, so you're like, okay, that's done. But equity beta for Nosebook, so I'm going to use the symbol NB, NB is short for Nosebook, Nosebook's equity beta we don't have. Why? Because Nosebook is a private firm. Its stock does not trade. If its stock does not trade, there are no stock returns whose sensitivity you can gauge against market-wide movements and measure its equity beta. So if you don't have an equity beta for Nosebook, you can't really calculate the expected return on equity for Nosebook either. And notice, of course, that the expected return on equity is something that you need for your weighted average cost of capital calculation as well. For Nosebook, you are told that the firm's target debt ratio is 20%. So this is given, so 0 0.20. You are told that the cost of debt for Nosebook is 5%. So this is given. The corporate tax rate, if you look at the question, is given. That's 21%. So this is 0.79. And if the target debt ratio is 20%, equity is the remainder. So this is 0.8. All this is good, but you don't have this number. 
So with that said, notice that ultimately this question is about figuring out the equity beta for Nosebook because all the other ingredients are given. And at first blush, you might say, well, you know what? I have the betas of my competitors. Why can't I just take an average of these three and then use that to say that, well, you know what? On average, equity beta for Nosebook is like the average of the competitors. That line of thinking is not bad, except you cannot do that with equity betas. And the reason is that equity betas are at least in part influenced by leverage. In other words, the reason why firm X has a beta, more specifically an equity beta of 0.8, is because it has debt of 10%. All else equal, as indebtedness goes up, it increases the risk that equity holders are bearing and as a result causes equity beta to go up. And notice that in our example as well, if you look at firm Y, firm Y has an equity beta of 1.2 and it also has higher debt compared to firm X. So at least in part, firm Y has a higher equity beta because of the high leverage that it has. Similarly, firm Z has an equity beta of 1.5 and it has the highest debt ratio among the three. The point being that to the extent that Nosebook is going to have a debt ratio that is going to be different from its competitors, we cannot just use the average of the equity betas of our competitors and use that to approximate the equity beta for Nosebook. However, what we can say is that the underlying asset beta of Nosebook should be similar to the asset beta or the unlevered beta of firms X, Y, and Z. In other words, if we were to strip away the effect of leverage and figure out the underlying unlevered beta, which is the beta that would exist for firm X in the absence of any leverage, that beta by definition would just reflect the riskiness of the cash flows of the underlying assets that firm X has. And if we do the same thing for firm Y and if we do the same thing for firm Z, now we have figured out the riskiness of the cash flows that are purely driven by the nature of the assets. And because Nosebook is in the same line of business, if we take the average of that unlevered beta for firm X, Y, and Z, we can say with more comfort that that average represents the unlevered beta or the asset beta for Nosebook. And so this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to make use of the equity beta information that is given for firms X, Y, and Z, and the debt ratios, which I can denote by B over B plus S. This is the debt ratio in market value terms. I'm gonna use these two pieces of information to figure out the underlying asset beta for firm X, Y, and Z, or the underlying unlevered beta. Recall that asset beta or unlevered beta is equal to S over B plus S, which is the equity ratio that a firm has times the equity beta, where the equity ratio is just one minus the debt ratio. So for firm X, for example, if the debt ratio is 10%, the equity ratio is 0.9 or 90%. And so for firm X, you can calculate as 0 0.9, which is 1 minus 0.1, multiplied by equity beta, which obviously is given, which is 0.8. And so this gives you 0 0.72. Okay, you can do the same calculation for firm Y. Firm Y has a debt ratio of 25%, which means its equity ratio is going to be, correct, 0.75 or 75%. I take that and multiply by 1.2, and so this gives me 0.9. I do the exact same thing for firm Z. Debt ratio is 36%, so equity ratio is 64%, and I multiply that by 1.5, and if you do this math, you will find that this number is going to be 0.96. What I'm saying to you is that what you can do is that you can take the average of these three and say that the asset beta on average, I'm going to use this bar to denote the average. And if you take the average, 
the average acid beta of your competitors is coming out to 0.86. And what I'm saying is that you can say with much more comfort that you can use this as the acid beta for nosebook, the acid beta for nosebook or the unlevered beta for nosebook. Recall that acid beta is something that does not by definition change with leverage. And we also know that acid beta is equal to the equity ratio times equity beta. And if you're doing this for nosebook, then you're saying that the acid beta for nosebook has to be equal to the equity ratio that nosebook is targeting. So NB stands for nosebook times the equity beta for nosebook. Why am I doing this? Because in order to calculate the cost of equity, we need this guy. And what this analysis has helped us do is that it has helped us figure out the underlying acid beta for nosebook. So we do know that 0.86 has to be equal to the product of these two numbers. Well, guess what? We were further told that nosebook has a target debt ratio of 20%, which means its target equity ratio is how much? Correct. 1 minus 0.2 or 1 minus 20%, which is 80%, so 0 0.80, multiplied by this guy we don't know. This is the equity beta for Nosebook, which is exactly what we're after. And based on this now, we can say that equity beta for Nosebook is going to be equal to 0 0.86 divided by 0 0.8 which if you do the math will give you 1.075. So now going back to the problem here, when we were trying to figure out the expected return on equity, we were told that the risk-free rate is 4%. This was given. And guess what? We have just figured out that the equity beta for Nosebook is 1.075 we can multiply that by the expected market risk premium, which is given in the problem as 7%. This will give us approximately 11.53%. That is the number that is going to go into our WAC equation for cost of equity. And so now if you do all the math, you will find that the weighted average cost of capital is going to come out to about 10.01%. One quick caveat before we conclude this video. When we use this formula that expresses the relationship between acid beta and equity beta, the underlying assumption behind this formula is that debt is risk-free, which is the same thing as saying that the cost of debt is equal to the risk-free rate. That is actually not the case in this problem. The risk-free rate is given as 4% and the cost of debt is 5%. This means that debt does have some risk. The difference between 5% and 4% is not that big. In other words, debt is not that risky, which means that it's close to being risk-free. Nonetheless, please keep this in mind when you do problems like these, because in situations where debt is risky, so that the cost of debt and the risk-free rate are significantly different, technically, you cannot use this formula exactly, but it turns out that there is a modification that you can do to still calculate the underlying acid beta and then lever that up to figure out the equity beta, but that's for a separate video. If you found this video useful, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to ask any questions using the comment section. Happy learning.